Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, the Black Woman Animator, coming back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Steven Ohio GBA. Welcome, Steve O. Hey, thanks for having me. So, um, I want you to give like a brief, like 15 to 30 second intro about yourself, like who you who you are, and then I'll get into the questions. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So I'm Stephen George Ohio GBA. I am a combat designer, game designer. If, if you don't know exactly what a combat designer does, but I work for Sony Santa Monica. I've most recently worked on God of War and I've worked on other small titles. I basically create digital experiences for all ages. Cool. So my first question is, where are you from and how was it growing up? Cool. Yeah. So I'm from New York. And I think like whenever you're talking to other New Yorkers or, or you like try to zero in exactly where you're from. So I'm from upstate New York, which is about three hours from the city. It's a place called Albany. But within Albany, there's a smaller place called East Greenbush or Rensselaer area. Uh, so I grew up in a suburb in East Greenbush. And um, basically, there wasn't a whole lot of people that looked like me out there. And I was made to kind of feel like an outsider because I'm dyslexic. I have these things that are affecting me and that put me into like different classrooms, but I was still an athletic person. I was still tall, still having, like still trying to navigate that space with all these different things that are happening, not being white out there, not being, uh, needing assistance. So not seeming like I could do the work already for just, just because I'm in a different classroom or working with different people. Uh, but the things that I really loved about the area is like, it still had a New York kind of vibe. Everybody's like very hustle mindset. And um, being in the suburb, there's a lot of like friendly people and the school system actually had resources to help people that are have the same affliction as me. So nice. I'm very thankful uh, that they're able to do that for me. So um, what was your relationship with art and animation during your childhood? Yeah, so I grew up watching tons of like, my brother was big into hip hop and with that he was big into like martial arts movies and anime. So he actually used to bring these tapes back. He, he worked at like a comic book store, I think at some point, and it was by manga. So he would come back and, and show me these like wild uh, movies. One would be like Ghost in the Shell, it'd be like Akira. My, one of my favorites was like uh, Giant Robo, just these like these Japanese films that were just beautifully hand drawn and, and put together. So I really fell in love with that. Um, I also really enjoyed watching this show called Closure That Explains It All, where she would make video games out of her everyday problems and she would solve those problems in the show by making a game about it. So from there, I was able to see like these dope animations that are happening mm -hmm. and putting together that people actually make video games and you can make games about your life. And that's like what inspired me to really get into more animation and game development. Yeah, when you said that on the D on the D nine panel, I was like, for real? like I, I like I feel like I halfway watched Clarissa explains it all, and I'm like, I don't I don't remember that part. Yeah, yeah. So exactly, I feel like all of the different shows like touch you differently, right? So right. that's something that always stood out to me. I was like, yo, how does she do this? And like, and it was goofy. Like there was like goofy animations in the game itself too, right? Yeah. So, but it was always about like her brother or whatever, but. Yeah, and I was so young when that show came out, but I think as as most artists and really successful artists, you realize your passion at like such a young age. I was okay. reading, um, I was reading uh, Rock Kim's book, and he was talking about how music started talking to him and how he picked up the mic at like four years old. And when I look back at my own journey, that's about the time that I was watching uh, Carissa explains it all. So him, I think it was three actually, but for me it was four. Yeah. So to go back to what you were saying about growing up, where were you like? pushed into like special ed classes because of what happened and like how did when did they find out that you were dyslexic yeah i said i should go way deeper into that so uh i originally and, went to okay so just start with what dyslexia is first and then go into oh it. yeah 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 so dyslexia okay. is like basically um some people will see words either like flipped or distorted or just have a hard time uh, processing the symbols that we read today. Though usually the way I explain dyslexia and how it affects me is like reading the, the world in binary. For me, like uh, binary is very easy. Binary is like ones and zeros, right? So zero equals zero and then the one equals one, but that's in the, the one spot. And the second spot of one equals a, equals a two. So zero, like zero, 
one makes two here. But if I do this, that makes three. Right. And as you keep going, you get more and more numbers, right? So for me, that's like words. Like over time, like a four letter word could mean a whole bunch of things to me. And it could take a lot of processing power. And then you start getting into six letter words or like, you know, six letter binary or, or seven and or 14, right? Like hippopotamus, like I don't even know what that looks like sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the other parts is because of that, uh, it's difficult for me to process English language. Like sometimes I might not know where commas and things go because I already had like such a, a long time just learning how to read. And I, I know we'll talk about how I learned how to read later. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, I guess getting back to me growing up and realizing that I had dyslexia. So I think uh, any child or like my, my parents felt like they would just read books and read comics and read things. And they just thought I would pick it up. And they were noticing that I wasn't picking it up at all. Like I just, they read me a book and be like, what does this say? And I, I just wouldn't know. And it never dawned on them that I was having an issue. Um, and I went to an all black school very early from um, kindergarten to about third grade. Mm -hmm. And they noticed that I was, I was slow at it too. And they tried to put me on like hooked on phonics and all the little things that were like on TV that were like popular at the time to help me learn how to read. And it just wasn't, it wasn't working for me there. Um, so uh, an incident happened and I grew up in Schenectady before moving to East Green, but an incident happened in Schenectady where the house next to us burnt down. So my mom was trying to get out of that area and we moved to the suburbs. And immediately in third grade, they recognized that I was having trouble and eventually put me in a special ed, special needs class. I think we call it special needs at this point, mm -hmm. uh, where somebody would take notes or read to me or give me extended time because I'm still mentally very, you know, there and I can I, mm -hmm. I keep up with everybody. But when it comes to reading, I'm very slow because I have to do that decoding process every right. time there's word or trying to like write that out, uh, trying to like sound out or figure out words at in third grade to about high school, I did not have the capabilities of doing that. And I was always assigned a personal teacher's aid. Shout out to Miss Woodward, you know, mm -hmm. love her to death, who, who actually followed me from about fifth grade to high school, kept jumping because uh, the way the school system set up, it would be like, you know, uh, this age range is elementary school, middle school, and then high school. So she was able to like keep moving jobs just to keep working with me and having that stability, that person who knew me and who knew what was happening with me with, within the um, special uh, special needs uh, cl classroom, mm -hmm. uh, it really it inspired me to learn more because she would read to me like during um, our, our study breaks and stuff like that. She'd read mm -hmm. to me all types of little books that kept me like in thirsty for more knowledge, even though I couldn't, I couldn't do it myself. So she would read yeah. all the Harry Potter things. And a fun fact, like before I learned how to read, I would memorize the page, like whatever oh. she said, I would memorize. And I would use that in my, in my, uh, in the classroom to memorize notes. But oh. there was also like just the, the East Greenbush area is just amazing. Lindsay Stockman, this girl who used to sit next to me, she would write all these notes for me as well before oh. missionary. And, uh, you know, I didn't really have the heart to tell her that I can't, I can't really read it. I can't do much with it. <laughs> Uh, I just thought it was so dope that she would write her notes and also write my notes. So lifelong That's friend cool. there. So, <laughs> a little track of, of there, but that was kind of like the early, uh, early stages of me getting into special needs. Mm -hmm. And I talked about how I was already black out there in a the suburb. Mm -hmm. and there's not too many black people where people look like us out there. Now I'm in the special needs thing. So most people are looking at me and I'm already kind of weird and quirky too already. Like mm -hmm. just, I went to RIT, like you, you know how we already are. Uh, <laughs> but they saw that as like, you're black, but you don't act black. So you're weird. You're mm -hmm. special needs, so you're weird. And then amongst my special, uh, you know, the friends in the, in the special needs classroom, they noticed that I didn't really need it that much. Like to them, you know, like they, they had some other issues that were really challenging for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're just like Steve's really smart. Like we don't understand. And and they're not. It's not that they're they weren't smart. It was just like they had challenges. They didn't see my affliction as much. Yeah. So yeah. My challenge. So uh, there I there I am now. I'm an outsider amongst them as well. So like lunch used to be a really lonely time for me where I didn't really sit down or have many friends to like confide in because I was so other until mm -hmm. I actually embraced that otherness. I used to start to like eat lunch in a, a study room like by myself and Miss Woodward didn't really quite understand that for a long time because you know uh 
even there, they, they were still like figuring out how to communicate with, nah, that sounds too crazy. Uh, this is a suburb. So they were behind on like black education sometimes and like yeah. the black experience. And me, I was having a black experience, a dyslexic experience, a feeling like other experience. So it was just, I'm, I got used to that at a very early age that I'm just different sometimes. So, so like, do you have a personal journey with your thought on your intelligence? Like, or did you always think you were intelligent? Yeah, no, I think it, it was the teachers. It wasn't just Ms. Woodward. There's other teachers that really instilled in me that I am, you know, I am capable of doing just about anything. Uh, but it's a struggle, especially uh, in the early days, because most dyslexics, before people realize they're dyslexic and they're having this, this problem communicating, they might be labeled as um, uh, disruptive for mm -hmm. different, so, so I was a problematic child too. So I was always getting in trouble because I just had no way of expressing and the frustration of not being able to communicate, like looking at things and just not knowing, and just giving up, right? Like at from fifth grade to like eighth grade, words beyond the would be like, would uh, give me trouble. And just like small words you see every day, like I, I got that, but anything beyond like anything that was complex. So, and then other people seeing me in special needs made me feel like I, you know, I couldn't keep up with them. And it's still something that I, you know, I work with today. Um, I had to talk to a therapist for a long time, even like all the way out here in California now, eventually was seeing that that was a, dra a trauma that I had to work through that like, no, I am capable, I am enough, even if uh, it might take me a little bit longer to read things, I still wanna get that knowledge and I still am capable of like keeping up with my coworkers. And um, eventually, you know, like, hopefully I'll write a book or something about it. Yeah. yeah I thought that would be interesting. <laughs> There's a, a guy on Facebook that I follow, um, Father Nathan Monk, and I think he's dyslexic and he he just came out with a book because he's not a, he's he's not a father anymore like he left the church or whatever oh, oh but, gotcha, gotcha. i was like oh no he lost his child oh. <laughs> no <laughs> no he left the church but okay. um he's he's kind of the reason like on social media you know i'm very big on like grammar and spelling but because mm -hmm. of following his page he talks about how like that's classes and some people are dyslexic and can't help it. So I kind of like bag back on that type stuff now. So yeah, it's it's so hard. I uh, maybe there'll be a portion for that, but I could talk about certain applications that try to help me with the grammar. That's just something that's so lost on me. And uh, yeah. uh, back then, before like hearing about him, they would talk about like. Um, who's the guy in Mission Impossible? There'd be like this list of people they would always push on us and be like, yeah, this guy's dyslexic and this guy's dyslexic. I'm like, okay, it doesn't, this is inspiring, but like, it doesn't help. <laughs> I can't, this guy's not gonna help me. Right. So, yeah, so, but there's a new book um, that I read called The Dyslexic Advantage recently. And, and by read, I mean, I actually listened to it on audio tape. But yeah. uh, I like to say I read sometimes. I do actually. I, I be listening to stuff because I read slow. So I be, like I read so slow. Like I'd be like getting like lost in my thoughts. And yeah. So I like to listen to stuff. Yeah. So I actually do read books. Um, I asked for you know most of the promotions for this video to be put in open dyslexia, but I have that on my Kindle. So I read things on a Kindle with open dyslexia, and that like uh, mm -hmm. really helps. It cuts through like the mental fog of me reading and stuff too. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the dyslexic advantage talks about the positive, the upsides. Basically, like the the cones in my head are just round or uh, arranged differently, and it's not a true spectrum. But like on one side is autism, and the other side is like dyslexia. And autism is like being very focused on the one tree, but dyslexia is about like there's so many cones that like information passes through so many trees that I can associate things that normally wouldn't go together, and it actually helps me like have a really good spatial awareness. Like I remember places and uh, a lot easier. And I'm also, another advantage, I guess, personally for me is like when I navigate through the world, I'm not bogged down by what I what words come at me because I don't read them right away. So I look at the world as like shapes and colors and things too. And I don't feel like I have to read every word that, that 
uh, people see him. Like my brother said, like he can't look at a word and not read it. And I thought that was like, oh man, that sucks. Like <laughs> I, I opt in. Like every word that I see, I'm like, do I want to read that? Nah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, talk about learning to read Wilson. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, early on, like I was saying in, in grade school, they were just helping me by reading things to me and, and having note takers and things like that. But eventually I got to high school and there's people who are trained in this Wilson uh, reading program, which I think it was a married couple that created this um, curriculum to help people who are having trouble, not dyslexic, dyslexic people, but just anybody to learn how to read, I believe. And it had these like card drills, like every day they would drill me on th this letter makes this sound and these exceptions make this word. And, and we would just work on that. And I, I, you know, I'm really thankful to Mrs. Allen, Mrs. Caporta and all the other people in the Wilson Learning Program at Columbia High School that helped me learn how to read. And up to that point, I, uh, I just couldn't do it. And it was very frustrating in the beginning because it's like belittling. Like they're like, all right, we're gonna teach you why R is R. And I'm like, I know R, like I can read some stuff, you know? <laughs> and and there's still some baggage of like memorizing yeah. things too and not like yeah. chunking and putting things together. And there's and you realize that the English language is created to hold some people back and to mm. be confusing and have exceptions so that you can um so you can tell how, so you can use it as a metrics of, a, of intelligence when it's really not. It's just like, oh, well, you don't, like the guy was saying, like, you don't know how to use grammar. You don't know how to use this word properly. But anyway, yeah, so I drilled, drilled that. I, was, I came in reading at a, like a third grade level in high school and I left reading at almost a college level in just taking that like every other day I think for the four years in college. And I started to be able to read in that, in those, after doing the drills and, and learning chunking and things like that. We started reading like little books and stuff together. It, it was tiring, but yeah, just in the, the four years really feels like half a year of dedicated time. Uh, I, I started to learn how to read and I'm really thankful. I, at some point I would love to make a game that makes it more interactive mm -hmm. uh, or have cool animations to it because it yeah. really is this person has to sit with you and deal these cards out and say like, nope, this is th th and like do like to just, uh mimic and and get you to really understand how each word, letter combination of ones and zeros work together so yeah i can see how streamlining streamlining that into a game would be helpful yeah yeah i'm excited um you heard it here first <laughs> <laughs> so talk about adapting to college yeah okay so i, I talked about you know feeling other in the middle school and high school was, it was difficult um and learning how to read. When I got to college, all that stuff was stripped away. Miss Ward can't follow me to college now, you know. Uh, so what am I going to do? Um, they did have a really good uh, support system out there. They had note takers that could write the stuff down and, and take it. Um, but and I got extended time, so like uh, I could go to another room and take and take classes, uh, take a test during a, an extended portion of time, which is like thirty other thirty more minutes, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the biggest things for me was like unity house and like leaning on the shield of sigmas and zetas <laughs> to like just avoid certain classes like i, I got into a history class and i had to withdraw like nothing was going to help me there because even getting the notes like reading the notes still takes a lot of time and i was running track at that time but mm -hmm. i just needed to be savvy on like okay i need to put all my energy in the programming and, and any course that's like more art so I don't have to read as much or retain as much because I just don't have time and it's gonna mm -hmm. be too difficult. But there were times that I got some proofread reads by some Zetas that helped me out, you know, uh, all the other guys at, at U House would help us and, and, and just study and certain things like that. So basically I got ripped away from my safety net and I had to learn how to adapt and make sure that I was taking like the right courses and lean more into my major and, and make sure that I can do things that are project based and did not have as many quizzes or tests where I had to write things down because if I if I had to write a paragraph during a test, mm -hmm. it's just not gonna work for me. Yeah. Uh, eventually in grad school, there was a lot more reading, but my friend and mentor, we actually went to un we were in a couple undergrad classes together. Uh, Brian May, he discovered the open dyslexia font. 
And that changed like everything for me because now mm. I can throw things in Word and start to read it a lot faster because the mm. chunking still took time. But uh, I guess the big takeaways here was I no longer had somebody to help read something to me or write things down for me. And I had to find different new ways to get around that, which was like avoiding classes where that was needed altogether if possible. Yeah. Uh, but if not, then have a good batch of friends that would help me study or, or proofread things for me. So I had a couple of friends, like I would say some things and they would write it down or they would see what I was trying to say and, and be able to clean up the words. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, college gotta be strategic. I, I know I had to be strategic. I'm like, okay, I came here for a Bachelor of Fine Art in Film and Animation. I got behind on my first quarter film. Hmm, that means, and I took that class three times. Oh man, yeah, that's <laughs> so money. Then, like my two, my, my two quarter film was gonna be my junior, wait, no, my two quarter film was gonna be, take my, Junior, like I, I was gonna graduate a year later. Like my thesis yeah. was gonna have to be done in a fifth year because I got behind. Mm -hmm. so I was like, hmm, let me just change to a Bachelor of Science in Multidisciplinary Studies, which is make your own major. Yep. Because in animation, it don't really matter what your degree is in. And yep. I ain't about to pay these people more money <laughs> for a fifth year. <laughs> like, exactly. so I like actually have less classes to take to finish my BFA, but it just was gonna take more time. Yeah, so, and okay. then, you know, after my year, like your year, they started changing the curriculum. And so they mm -hmm. had all these science and math courses. So I actually had to like catch up and like take all those science and math courses because they didn't have them when I came to RIT. So I had yeah. like so many more classes to, to take to graduate, but it still was gonna make me graduate quicker. <laughs> Yeah. So when I got there, they tried to put me in like a basic writing course that mm -hmm. had no credit. It was just like another class I had to sit and endure. And like, I was like, I'm not going to get better at writing. Like, it's not going to help me. But eventually I got through it with my zero credit. But by the time I graduated, they, they made it a credit. They gave me two credits. So I got oh. it. But um, other, other issues that I had. Mm -hmm. So even in programming, when you're like creating variables and things like that, you mm -hmm. have to type them out. And I, man, I was just really good at copy pasting just the, the variable name. Um, but there was one class where you have to type it all in. I think it was like, I don't remember the name, but it, it, it you had to use like select and um, options. And I could not remember how to spell select. And I was like failing these quizzes and tests. And then the, the teacher was like, oh, it's cause you spelled select of union wrong. And I was like, yeah, it's select just the two E's and the L, like it always messes me up. Yeah. So those courses where like I knew the information, but I mean, I would make a mistake. And even to this day, like my my code always has like, instead of trigger, it says Tigger or something like that, you know? Yeah. Like it just, yeah, that just happens. And I just want to let people watch and know like, okay, so Unity House, so at RIT there's like special interest house, right? And so there's like Unity House, which is for African-American, like history kind of there's like international yeah. house house of general science engineering house uh business leaders i don't know whatever right. and so unity house is like integral to black people at rit's life if you decide to opt in to that <laughs> like if you decide to go black like <laughs> and I, I did right like i was a big thing like i even wrote the essay well i didn't my mom to full disclosure my mom wrote the essay to get me into unity house uh but uh I wanted to be there because I, for most of my life, I was lacking that black experience. And she was like, no, you might get distracted, this and that. Before Unity House, like before IRT, I wanted to go to Howard. I, I just wanted to be around people who look yeah. like me. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a great, great environment where it allowed me to feel at home and, and make strong bonds and connections with people. And like I said, I ended up leaning on those people that are like, hey, how hard was this course? Like, hey, let's all take physics together because it's yeah. hard and like one person knows it can help teach us all all the physics and things like that. So Uni House, love them to that. So, uh, so you're my fraternity brother. Can you tell, yeah. Talk about what attracted you to joining a fraternity and how it helped you in college and how it's affected your life until now. Yeah, we talked on that a little bit, uh, but yeah, I'm a member of Phi Beta Sigma that is also constitutionally bound to Zeta Phi Beta. Uh, yep, <laughs> uh, so going into college, I had no idea about fraternities. Maybe I saw like Emmett Smith with like his tattoo, uh, not his brand, 
um, on, on him. And I was like, what's that one time? But uh, I had no idea. So when I got there, it was it was kind of a little bit of culture shock to see how like, these guys were really cool. But what really attracted me was the members, you know, being able to talk to like Kenneth and Hassan and um, be, they were always at Unity House and always around. And they felt so grounded. And they, to me, they were of the people. So having access to them and being able to talk to them and see how they move, like inspired me uh, to to join because I realized they were like a platform that could help me change the world or make a world a little bit better. And they mm -hmm. could help make me a little bit better. So it felt like this symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we put on some really great programs together and I really enjoyed what they were doing on campus. And then I looked at the, the national, like when, when you're going through your process of learning, um, I looked at the national levels and really felt like their ideals match what I already meant, like culture for service and service for humanity. Mm -hmm. Meaning like, for me, I always wanted to give back to people knowing my experience was, was tough, but I always want to lift people up. Like, hey, I'm going to learn how to do this. And I'm always going to come back to the community that I came from and give them knowledge from it. And I, I, I still do that to this day. Uh, that's where things get really interesting. I mean, there, there's some some thought that people, I don't know, like, I guess we could, don't have the coach switch, but I, anyway, so the portion of time, you know, when you're, when you're interested in uh, a fraternity and stuff that you have to learn some things and that it can be difficult for yeah. someone who has difficulty reading, right? So uh, <laughs> yes. I, could not, I could not read, or let's say if you meet somebody, you know, you got to write down their information. I could not write down anybody's information. So I'm kind of useless in those aspects, right? <laughs> So uh, I actually had to learn all of my information by listening to my line brothers, like oratory, just every day. And if I ever meet anybody new, I gotta just remember what you know. It's just, uh, so you know, uh, I just have to remember things um, mm -hmm. and writing it down. But I won't go too much into that. But <laughs> you can imagine if if stuff like that, you know, were to yeah. happen, like how difficult it could be not being able to uh, read or write. Yeah, uh, I kind of made up for a bit being funny, more as, as funny as yeah, I that's could. It. So, like if you can make people laugh, they leave you alone. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I kind of tell my sisters that, but they would always listen. I'm like, just make them laugh. <laughs> just be funny. It was great. So I, I was extra funny, and then try to do extra more physical stuff. You know, it's, uh, allegedly, right? Is, is that what, that's a new thing? I don't know if any of that stuff really happened, but allegedly. So, <laughs> so um. Um, so do you think joining Sigma was the start of your desire to volunteer your time or did you already have that in you? I, I think I had a piece of that in me because I would do extracurricular activities when uh, presented mm -hmm. in high school. I think it just gave me a bigger platform to do it. So like, oh, like, hey, let's let's sleep out here for the March of Dimes or like, hey, let's come up with different programs. Like what does what what do people need to know about and how how can we educate them? Um, but yeah, I think it just really fostered that. It like it it stoked the flames. Like there was, yeah. was a little ember there. There's something I wanted to do mm -hmm. uh, by joining. They really like invigorated me to get to get better. And the leadership too. Like um, being able to communicate and organize yourself to get tasks done as a group mm -hmm. is like um, is an amazing thing because I, I still do that at work now. Any anytime I'm on a team, I have like I've had experience doing this or, or capital. Yeah people's attention to get things done, you know, so. Yeah, I feel like High Lambda really um, spoiled me as far as like people's work ethic. <laughs> Cause I'm just Dude. like, man, y'all are trash out here in this world. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm trying to be nice about it, but yeah, like <laughs> just being resourceful, man. Like in all my other jobs, I felt like people weren't as resourceful or resilient. Like when something happens that doesn't go your way, you don't get the money you want, you don't get the program that you need and it's like yo we just still gotta make this happen we gotta figure it out we gotta yeah. figure it out in a couple minutes you know yeah. time we can't be like next meeting we'll figure it out. no we'll figure this out <laughs> right now we're gonna get it done so yeah um, uh, th there's this story i tell people but you are like the perfect person to tell so like the world is so small so like i'm over in korea right and I think I'm, I was still teaching English. I wasn't working for the animation company yet. Okay. And this is like Korea is like the first time I was financial in my adult life. <laughs> right, right. I could actually afford it. And so. <laughs> expensive. Like, yeah. So I would be on the military base because, um, you know, we always say like our 
organizations are international and it's like, oh, they're all mm-hmm. military jobs. Yeah. So I met a lot of mar- military people. Mm-hmm. I met a dude who pledged Iota Phi. Oh, over yeah, I didn't see what chapter I'm from. Wait, you who? who? I, probably, uh, I probably learned um, his name. <laughs> ah, what is his name? Um, Corwin Mason. Yeah. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, so like, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're like the ex husband of my favorite Zeta. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, why you gotta say it like that, though? <laughs> I mean, they are exes. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know him. I knew right. Carla. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like yeah. oh my gosh, like, how am I on the other side of the world? And I yeah. met somebody who pledged but- at, a, at the chapter at my school that I went to college. That's so random. So small, but yo, so dig this. Like I, we didn't talk about this too much, but like I moved from New York to to Austin. Just we'll, yeah. I guess we'll get into that at one point. And I met uh, a brother, a bro out there, Sigma, who um, he's from Rochester, pledged in Albany, and I'm mm-hmm. from Albany, pledged in Rochester, and he's three. I'm a three, and like he just changed my whole Texas experience. Like we just. Came, like I kind of knew of him a little bit from like uh, uh, seeing like Mu I out there in Albany, but like, yeah, if, if it wasn't for Barry, like man, my whole my whole Austin experience would be terrible. Like I would have been by myself. Oh man, there's like no black people in Austin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would have been it would have been very difficult. So he introduced me to more Sigmas and Zetas, and then I met another Sigma who had the same birthday as me. But I don't, I don't tell people my birthday, but we had the same birthday, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's the best part. It's just the being with the network and wherever yeah. I went, I always found more blue and white to help me out. Seattle, met Zeta there, mm-hmm. th- was introduced to the whole city in a different way. Yeah, and, um, I, I think that's the one of the best parts about it. Yeah. So what um, what made you decide to get a master's? Oh yeah. So basically, I think the economy wasn't doing too well in the. <laughs> By the time I was gonna graduate, right? I graduated in 2010. I got my master's and graduated again in 2012. They helped pay for it. They liked me so much because, like, you know, the work ethic that I had before, plus like the discipline of sigmas and, and stuff, mm-hmm. uh, just made me this really uh, person that was getting after it. Like at the time, there wasn't even a game design major when I when I joined. There was a mi- uh, a minor that you could take, but I knew that the major was coming on, so I like rewove my classes to like fit in the major before the major even happened. So mm. they noticed that and they noticed that I was working really hard. So I was able to talk to them and say, hey, can I, I, I would like to stay another two years and build this game with my friend Ben Dapowitz while we get our master's here. And they felt like, yeah, if you become a lab manager, we'll pay for half your curriculum. Nice. And uh, yeah, you can basically like take some of the same courses over again, but do a deeper dive into it. Mm-hmm. But during that time, me and Ben, we created a small company uh, with the hopes to release a game. Mm-hmm. Uh, that just never really, it, it, we got it, but it, it never went on to XBLA, like XR, Xbox Arcade, the way that we liked. But yeah. uh, we actually took on um, co-op students to help us put the game together and didn't give them any money, but we gave them mm-hmm. equity in the company. But, mm-hmm. you know, shares of zero are still zero. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I stayed because it it was going to give me more time to hone my craft in an environment that was kind of familiar. The the bad part though was everybody still. I ended up like graduating and and, and staying at RIT and working on this game called Mind Gamers. The, the mm-hmm. yeah for autism people who were suffering from autism. Mm-hmm. Uh, but everybody still thought I was like a student. They just thought I was like this epic epic undergrad. And I'm like, no, nah, I graduated twice, like on time. <laughs> Had a whole like I'm I'm staff now. My thing says staff. Like I work. Here. Right. So I was like I gotta get out of here. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, but but the master's part was like just a really home, and and we ended up like changing how capstones were done because we, me and Ben, our first year in the in the graduate program, we started working on a second year's gra- uh, capstone. So that gave us like more experience because we were looking to build the company and, and things like that. Gave us more experience, but I think it started to set this precedent that people who are on a capstone project who want more manpower can start to pull people up from undergrad or uh, first year grads to really help get the work done and to create better games. So when yeah. me and Ben became grad students, we also grabbed undergrads and first years to like really make our game even better. And every course in our uh, master's thing, we made, we're like making progress 
towards our capstone game. So instead of just working on it for two quarters at the time, which is about a yeah. year and a half, I mean, I mean a half a, uh, like a little bit more than half a year, yeah. uh, we ended up working on our game all year and a little bit into the summer and thinking that we were going to release Card Kingdom, uh, our student project. Yeah. That is still pretty dope to this day. Yeah, I understand the the, um, the looking young thing because, like, I feel like they ch changed RIT so much because I graduated in 2008. So uh -huh. they changed it so much in like, like a year or two's time. And so when I came back to the campus, I was like, how did, like, there's this building in the way and I don't know <laughs> how to get on the other side of it. And so I'm like, you know, I still look young. I still look like a college student. So right, imagine when I'm at, like two years out of out of college, I'm like staring. Like you know, they had the little sign with the map, and I'm like all far away. Like I don't want to look like I'm a student, but I'm like I need to know where I'm going, and I need to look at this map from like twelve feet over. <laughs> right. Like, you know. You know. RT only got like winter in construction. There's like a new building every year, and like, I was yeah. like why? What is all this stuff? And I'm like, I, there's like. I used to I be able to walk through this part, and now I can't, nope. and I don't know what to do. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't remember the name of those buildings now, but like, <laughs> even when I came back to work there, I started walk, walking through what used to be like a parking lot, but it was like a whole other sustainability building. And I was like, what is sustainability? Like back in 2012, I didn't even know what that really was. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, can you talk about... Uh, in the workforce a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I talked about kind of adapting and leaning on friends and, and fraternity brothers and, and sisters uh, to help me in college. But when I got to work, I, first of all, when I graduated, I uh, worked for the, for the school for a little bit. So I still kind of had like a little bit of support. Uh, mm -hmm. Ben had, had got a better job and worked for EA and stuff like that. But I was still on the on campus, like helping and just kind of getting my funds up before I went to work on an independent project. So the first project that I worked on, Mech Knight, it didn't really require me to do a whole lot of reading and writing. Um, we would talk, we'd have meetings and we'd talk about the design doc and I, that was like somebody else's uh, job to maintain and, and whatnot. But for me, it was just like working on the project, actually getting the timing and the frames and getting the characters to move around and come to life uh, in a combat scenario. So that felt good. However, I had to do some work for hire where I needed to write someone's game doc Mm -hmm. And it was bad. Like I could not do this thing very well. Uh, he was trying to make a. It was this is in Texas. He was trying to make a tractor pull game, mm -hmm. where uh, the characters were like kind of fighting tug of war, where they were tractor pull each other. Yeah. But I didn't understand tractors. I don't understand engines, and I could not speak to like designing this thing uh, very well. Mm -hmm. um, what I did do is like, I pretty much hired somebody to help me write it as, as well. So like, hey, you're gonna do all the proofreading, I'm gonna send you the stuff, you're gonna make corrections on it, and uh, I'll give you some of the proceeds. But, uh, so that was my first thing. Working at Sony now, uh, Sony Santa Monica is, is amazing in supporting me where they help, you know, when I graduated, I learned about open dyslexia, but mm -hmm. uh, eventually I learned about this other project pro, uh, program called Got It. It's spelled funky. I never remember how to spell it. But just like dyslexia is not like easy for people who are dyslexic to spell. Like I was like, I, why did you put all the things in here that I have trouble with? Uh, <laughs> so I, I can't always remember. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Got it is like a souped up. Um, oh, sorry. I feel like I keep jumping through things. In college, I started using this thing called Dragon Natural Speak to help me write my papers. Okay. Yeah. I, I remember my dad would use that. Yeah, yeah, but the weird part is you have to train it. So yeah, I, I remember it. that part. Like that's the specific part I remember. So I'm I'm reading these stories to this thing, but I can't read. So like <laughs> instead of you know instead of saying the right word, I'm saying the wrong read word. Your voice, so you can't have anybody else read it. <laughs> right. So anyway, uh, that that was a problem. But got it. It solved a lot of those problems. It doesn't. Uh, you don't speak into it. You end up typing words, and then it'll give you a list of words that it thinks you're trying to spell. And then on the side of that, it will play it, the audio version of it, and it will also give you the definition. So it's oh. like, you're, you're trying to spell, again, the word like select, I have a problem with that. Like, oh, you're trying to spell select. Select is like a distinguishing between two things. Or uh, the one word that gets me in trouble when like trying to write someone's uh, recommendation is like uh, weather. And there's like three versions of weather that will just, 
don't make any sense to somebody's like so there's weather that the like, atmospheric pressure there's right. weather this or that and then there's like a castrated goat and it's just like <laughs> And because grammar and they look, all look the same to me, it's like I don't, I don't want to mess this up. This right. like, anyway, so in the, the workplace, uh, Sony, uh, they bought, got it for me, and they allow me to use it on on all our internal documents and things like that. So it really speeds up the process. Right. The only thing is, because of the pandemic, I I think we're all going through different forms of anxiety. But for me, it was very crushing because a lot of times at work, I would walk and ask things out and talk to people face to face. Um, yeah, I'd write an email here and there, but we'd usually like collaborate by speaking and then saying, hey, let's do this. And I'd go and do it like right away. If somebody needed something that uh, was emailed to me or a task, somebody else kind of like already told me about it and I would get to it. But switching to work from home, there are just emails. It's just texts. And that's slow. And I'm in an industry that relies on being solving problems very quickly. So I was crushed in the beginning of this of just like, I'm going to lose my job because right. of dyslexia. Like it's, it's, it's going to take me longer to respond to everybody. It's also going to be more mentally draining every day to read and to try to tell, like even using got it. It's like now I have it's, it's not integrated into uh, Slack or Teams or anything. Right. So like yeah. I have to take their words out. It, it reads the it reads a sentence back to you and everything too uh and it also does the grammar check for you as well i also mm -hmm. use grammarly but anyway mm -hmm. so i have to take it out of there throw it in the got it write what i'm trying to say throw it back in there um sometimes that it, uh like outlook doesn't support my open dyslexia font so like other people will get a weird weird font instead of open dyslexia if they don't have it yeah uh, documents so there's still a lot of hurdles there but i i was really nervous early on that it's just like i'm gonna take too much time now and these things like I'm not going to be able to do this properly, communicate with people properly. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we got to this point where we've got cameras and, and we could talk uh, yeah. with the microphone. But yeah, it's something I still am nervous about every day. Like, if you write me a long thing, I, 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 I don't want to read it because it's just, it's it's so taxing. And I still have yeah. all these other problems I got to figure out. So, do you know the science behind the open dyslexic font? Yeah, yeah, actually I do. So the, the open dyslexia, it basically makes every character unique in four the all four quadrants. So like the problem with like the letter P or B or D is in most fonts, they're the same character just rotated and flipped. Mm -hmm. So if you have issues with, you know, you flip things already like P like D and B almost look the same to you a lot of the times, right? The yeah. same with like I or one. And, and um, I think things that get me is like E's and A's sometimes. And uh, yeah, so it makes every every part of the uh, character just unique in a, a slightly different way. So like for a, a P, it's like slightly more bent at the top or the B slightly more bent at the bottom. So it just has this uniqueness and it allows me to not sit there and focus on the character so much. And, and it makes it feel like it's not moving as much, not mm -hmm. as scary. Uh, and it's like really my mind like cuts through it a little bit better like butter. It's, it still takes some effort to to write out the word or read out the word every time, but yeah. it's, it's it's way less uh, time. So I think it's I think uh, there's a lot of games that are starting to incorporate it as a font for them too. There, there's a couple of things that uh, usability has been making strides with. Um, I feel bad because I didn't catch uh, a font issue with God of War 2018 that like we work on. Uh, TVs that are really close to our our kits. That's yeah. really easy to read. Uh, but one of our biggest complaints for uh, people who are hard of hearing or deaf is that that font is really small from far away. If you're sitting back on your couch and you're looking at the TV, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to read that font. Um, so, yeah. But they didn't use Open Dyslexia. They they created a font that's like got some similar properties, and we're doing even more stuff with uh, usability in the future. So, can you talk about like? Um maybe because you're, you're you're saying all of the resources that you have at your current studio but like for people who kind of deal with people who are dyslexic because i know um i'm guessing like voice notes are really good for you and yeah. all that stuff like what are some ways that you can kind of support your friend or whatever that is or your coworker that's dys dyslexic that can make it easier to interact i think most of the time you don't you won't even know that they are right mm -hmm. we have some quirks 
that I've noticed now, especially like because you work in other people's codes or or uh, script and whatnot, that someone who's dyslexic might pick up on another person being dyslexic. So first of all, they're probably stealth. They mm -hmm. might not know that they have it either. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times you'll hear about fathers relaying this thing. They, it's, I think it's hereditary. I think my father has it as well. It's mm -hmm. like fathers will hear about that they're dyslexic because someone will be explaining it about their son and see like that they also have this thing. So one thing you, you might not know, they might not know. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, voice notes would be big. Give them grace, giving them just a little bit more time to respond. Like if you're, if a team's chat, Slack chat, and you can see them typing, they might still be like, for me, sometimes I got to take a word out and I got to throw it into Google because it has the best way of, of figuring out what I'm trying to say if I'm not using got it. Um, using gram, suggest to them open dyslexia, suggest to them using Grammarly and, and paying for it will give you the little options and that's integrated in most things. Um, if you can speak to them, I would say speak to them more often than not. And if not, you have to write things out, write it out, write it out uh, in smaller chunks. Don't give them like a whole page of like, this is what needs to happen. Maybe you can do like a couple of paragraphs here and there, like, hey, do this. Or like, hey, we'd like to see the reports. Like, just so it's not so overwhelming when they open it. You yeah. Know? So that those are some things I think that can help. But I'm always looking for a bit for more tactics. Like we we had a, a speaker come in, Brian uh, McDonald, who works mm -hmm. at uh, who worked at I don't want to say the wrong thing, but who works in film. Yeah. And uh, when he was explaining and going through his class, I noticed that he was just drawing circles. And, and squares and things. And he mentioned that words are like the enemy to him as well. And when he's thinking about his scripts, you got to think about it all in his head. But I, I was really fixated on how he was communicating on the board and getting all of our attention on these different shapes that were simple for him to keep going back to. But he was using that to communicate with us. So I think just coming up with a strategy together could be helpful if you notice that somebody's dyslexic, like, hey, do you, do you want to draw this out or like, hey, maybe we can have a couple of simple symbols that mean this and this. So you don't have to always write the word out, especially on the board or anytime um, you have to write stuff in front of people. It yeah. creates so much friction and anxiety in me. Like if my lead or a boss or come over and they're like, hey, how does this work? And they're like, oh, just type, uh, just go to this file, type this out. And we, I was just like, I don't know how you spell I don't know. I'm trying to look at something like I don't know how you spell explain. Like that's, that's hard for me. So now I'm just like nervous. Yeah. No longer to do it the wrong way in front of them. So if yeah. you know somebody has it, if you're gonna ask them to do something, just ask them to do it. And maybe walk away and give them some time to like yeah. go through their process of like finding the thing and then come back. Cool. <laughs> A lot of stuff uh, there. Um, were you worried about like landing your first job in the video in the video game industry? Oh yeah, the video game industry is like the NBA, especially like, you know, uh, a lot of people want to be in it and not everybody is qualified and feeling like I have, I come with this quirk, yeah. you know, this this might slow me down uh, and I can't prove that, uh, well, not right out of the gate, I might not be able to prove that um, I'm a good fit for you guys, even though I have this quirk. So I was really nervous about telling people on my resume or maybe in an interview uh too early but I, I started to embrace that to just say like hey i have this thing um and this is how i cope with it this is how i overcome it instead mm -hmm. of just being like yeah i work hard it's like no this is how i this is exactly how i work with it like i mm -hmm. have these programs i have this font it slows me down a little bit but uh i i get through it by by talking to people and acting things out more mm -hmm. um when the pandemic hit i was really some of my coworkers knew but i was really concerned about reaching out to HR because I felt like if they were starting to let people go, then maybe this will make me a candidate for that. Like, hey, he's going to have a hard time at home reading and writing more, um, mm -hmm. at asking him for more time. I, I felt like they might let me go. Mm -hmm. So especially like being a candidate, trying to get into a job, it's like, ah, I mean, there's two guys equally qualified. This one's got this quirk that's kind of weird. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe not him. So I, I just built out portfolios. Like I, because of that game, Card Kingdom. It helped me land the Mech Knight thing. And then because I had worked on Mech Knight, it helped me get to Microsoft. And because I was at Microsoft in the, the Seattle area, I ended up jumping on this smaller team, Fat Princess Adventures, mm -hmm. fun bits. And because of that game, I met a producer that noticed uh, my hard work ethic and how I was doing that. And um, I had always studied God of War uh, mm -hmm. in college. 
and we've made games like it. I followed um, Eric Williams and uh, Jason McDonald on how they were creating the God of War characters. And I was able to speak to that in my interview. But when they asked me to go and write stuff on the board, like pseudo code or anything, that was a moment where I was just like, yeah, I'm having a moment. Is this like, can I just write? Like, it's not the words I'm going to write here aren't going to make sense to you sometimes, but being able to, to speak to what I was writing uh, helped. Yeah. And they noticed just, you just have to like be extra, extra. You have to be like better because you're black. And then you also have to be better because you have this quirk. So it's just yeah. Like, yeah, really, really extra talented to uh, get their attention. Yeah. Um, did you, uh, okay, so when you worked at Mind Gamers, you built like their things to help, you know, children dealing with autism and anxiety. I mean, that seems like a cool experience, like, because it's kind of therapy related yeah. art, like, what can you say about that game? Yeah. Or that, that project, uh, we worked with therapists to create this biofeedback game that had nodes that they put on their fingers and like on their chest area uh, that would monitor their breathing. I guess mm -hmm. when you have like OCD or um, uh, autism, like walking into a room and seeing things that are out of place or something that might give you an anxiety, right? So they, as a therapist, were using that to measure their breathing and say like, try, remember the exercise to like calm yourself down and you could see the response in their avatar in the game. They'd also have these two things, I forget the, the therapeutic reason for calling them imps, but there was the character that you wanted, the hero that you wanted to become. And then there was the thing that was like kind of afflicting you and pulling you towards, so you could like personalize what was going on in you. And especially like somebody who is familiar with like going through the world with this, this, this I keep calling it a quirk. I like, I kind of understood that it might be challenging for them. Uh, so I, I really connected and you could see that the game allowed you to take the skills you developed in that digital world into the real world. One oh, of the yeah. exercises would be like, okay, can your, can your avatar, not you, can your avatar walk up and touch that trash can? And like the thing that is fixing you is like pushing you away from it. And the other superhero guys all dressed up and it's like, no, you can do it, you can do it, right? So like you go in and touch the trash can and then in real life, they're like, hey, can you be like your avatar? Can you go and touch that trash can? Just theoretically, like it, it was super cool. And you actually were always practicing the breathing. And I think it kind of like spoke to why I wanted to eventually make this game for people who are dyslexic, like those fun typing games and things too, but not like that, but uh, yeah, yeah it, it was just great to work with therapists who who loved helping and have a medium that you can develop skills in a safe space that you can use in the real world and I just opened my eyes that like uh things I was learning in games can can actually help you in the real world yeah uh so what has been your experience working in so many different places in your career like because it's just so many different parts of the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what she's saying, like what Steph's saying here is like, I worked in the uh, New York for like a year or two and did it did some like contract work for hire, working with the, the school, working for some other, other companies that are around the area. And then I moved to a much warmer place in Austin. I moved there because I was just living off my savings that I had like made from co-ops and other things. And Austin is a really cheap place to live. And that's why that's why I chose it, because uh, I could stay there for about a year with just my savings. And I didn't know anybody. And I only knew the people that I might be working with on the startup. And they were great people. But uh, it was very cheap to live there. The food was good, warm weather. Mm -hmm. And I could really like sink or swim there. What things that I loved about Austin is still got all the, the seasons and the rain and whatnot but it also had a lot of freedom for me, like freedom on the open road, freedom to experience a different culture, like eating these like delicious gas station tacos and Tex-Mex and uh, you just start to learn more about yourself in a, in a, when you're in an uh, unfamiliar space. Mm -hmm. So I think that was just my first time living on my own and growing out and growing into my space. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest part is moving every time, like every couple of years, I was I was packing up my car and I, I never had any roots and I would just go from from Texas and drive. Uh, I flew up. My sister gave me some money to fly up to Seattle, and then making new friends again, getting yeah. used to the area again. Um, for the most part, the development stuff like I'm in a box, I'm in a cube or open space, and that felt the same. But uh, the loneliness uh, that comes with 
like living in LA and not having a walkable space and and not having uh there are there are blue and white or other people that I could reach out to, but it's so big and spread out. Sometimes yeah. it's hard to make those connections. Like, hey man, what are you doing today? Like, all right, well we're an hour away with traffic. Like, it's going down right now. You want to come come hang out? And then when I first got here, I didn't have a car, so yeah. oh, I got an Uber there. It's fifty dollars. Like, nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, the hardest part is like meeting people, mm -hmm. getting acclimated, finding a place to live. Uh, all the places are different, um, different price ranges, right? Like Texas was very affordable. Seattle started to get like not so affordable and then LA is just ridiculous, right? So yeah. uh, base is different. Like you get really accustomed to New York living where mm -hmm. everybody, how I grew up, everybody had like a washer and dryer in their unit and AC and it's great. And in Texas, washer dryer, you know that that's standard you know granite countertops like i, I was balling a little bit because yeah not flat, but you start getting to uh la like no coin it's outside i have no ac now it's carpet is you know and I, but i'm grateful because like when i first got here i made fun of that place and i had to downgrade to the place that i'm at now so mm -hmm. I'm, I, I love this place it's one of the cheapest places i can live and it's very comfortable uh, yeah it's modest and comfortable <laughs> so uh it's just finding a good spot to live that makes your home feel like sanctuary because I felt like uh, when I would come back from long days and not having a quiet place to like really decompress, it's, it would have, it would affect me. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you explain what combat design is? Oh yeah, combat design is the art of making you feel good about being violent in video games. Um, not so much. That's just kind of like the tagline that I say, but it's basically um, making a character move and react in a way that makes sense for a player. Like, oh, okay, like I can do this punch in this amount of time. And we usually describe that time in frames. Mm -hmm. um, so like, oh, okay, this frame, uh, this fight, this hit happens on frame 14 or whatever. It's really quick. Uh, after that, there's like a couple of frames or a portion of time where I'm vulnerable and you want that player to understand that that is a risk that you're going to take. If I, if I do this attack, there's going to be some repercussions. There's some benefit by hitting somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, there also are also some negative things that I have to be aware of. And then you start making decisions. You start saying, okay, well, this guy's big and slow. Maybe I'll use my fast attacks on him and create space. So the combat design is thinking about how the character can move, hit and defend, like not getting hit, uh, and, and and how you can make that interesting. So you start having more and more of those choices. Mm -hmm. um, for me, on the first, uh, on God of War 2018, I was an encounter combat designer. So I actually set up, how I tell people is like, I set up the, the background dancers to Beyonce. Cause uh, you know, like Beyonce is looking awesome when she's doing her thing, but like the background dancers are really there to enhance, mm -hmm. you know, the experience of, of, of seeing Beyonce. So. I didn't come up with the characters. I just placed them to make that dance feel good. Like, okay, what if the dancer comes in at this point? What if they come in at that point to make the player feel awesome and make them feel like Beyonce? You want to make it just hard enough that you're overcoming this this hardship and you feel awesome by like I was challenged, I was uh, put to my brink, and now I feel, and I have this like reprieve. Where is that? Yeah. For a second, but yeah, combat and encounter design. That's that's what I've been doing. And that's what it was. Yeah, I know there's some like, cause I'm not like a gamer gamer, but like, I know there's some people who love like games, no matter what kind it is, where they're like, they're like impossible. But I, I like, that's yeah. hard, but I feel like, like sometimes I play a game on my phone. If I feel like a, there's like a, I've gotten to the level where I cannot win this iteration, mm -hmm. I, I quit because I'm like, yeah. I don't think like if, if there's, if it's hard enough where I feel like, okay, if I had done something different, I probably could have won this level. But if I feel like there's nothing to do to win this level, I'm like, it's gotten too hard for me and I quit. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just the balance. That is that you're describing like, yeah, the combat like threshold of just being like, all right, what can I do differently to really come well, some up? Some people like, like the impossible. And I'm like- because there's a lot of like reward. There's a lot of satisfaction. Like this was so hard. Not too many other people can do it. There's there's yeah. certain genre, there's a certain genre, like not just like Dark Souls or Demon Souls, these games that are like known to be very challenging and you have to get good in the space. There's even harder games than that. They're just make, there's no feedback or, or lead up 
to like the dangers that are going to happen. Right. And it just happens. You just have to know and respond to that. But when you when you hit that flow state and you overcome those challenges, that's super rewarding. Yeah, and I think that's what we really look look for. It's not actually about I, I mentioned being violent. It's not actually about being violent in the real world. It's actually like coming uh, overcoming these obstacles yeah. that have been set by the designer and making you feel good about mm-hmm. that, like focusing on the good. And these are just pixels. These are just obstacles. It's fake. Yeah. <laughs> um. What drew you to this specialty? Oh yeah, so that goes back to earlier animation stuff, right? So I loved watching kung fu movies. I loved anime, the action action thing. So I used to watch the Five Deadly Venoms and uh, Kid with the Golden Arms, and I wanted to act those things out. And I became a martial artist for a couple of years and a gymnast. I did that all the way through high school, up to, up into high school, um, because I wanted to be able to recreate those moves and. Martial, like, I didn't want to get into, ah. so martial arts became very hard to upkeep at, at where I started to live. So I started to get into this game called Tekken. It's a fighting game and it looked like real martial artists. And I could still get that thrill of being in the martial arts world, but just focused on the avatar. And I started participating in little tournaments in my neighborhood. And at this, if you're in Albany, you know, this like this China food buffet place that everybody would go and play at. So I got really good at, at fighting games and because of that i started to understand the different frames and understand the advantages to being at a certain range uh and i didn't know what that was in college but it's shout out to my friend claude Jerome, who had worked at vicarious visions he met derek daniels who had worked on god of god of war i believe and realized that there's a whole role yeah. called the combat designer so because of that and my fighting game and being able to act out the, the moves in, in real life, I said like, oh, that's something I can dedicate my life to that. Because before that, I was thinking I was just going to be like a technical artist, like somebody who uh, rigs and puts together the character and how uh, the structures that help move it and solve other like technical problems so that people could animate or or uh, create the environment in a digital way. Mm-hmm. But instead, I was just like, yeah, actually, I love fighting. So, mm-hmm. but you know, I can't actually fight people in real life. So I fight them in these games, and now yeah. I create monsters for people to fight. Yeah, I know. Sometimes when I look at different animation, you know, because like for animators, like reference is king. And I'm like, sometimes I'm looking at animation. I'm like, somebody shot that reference themselves and then did their reference and not like professional reference because that looks like a sloppy kick <laughs> or that looks like. Like that looks like a non-professional did that. Yep, yep. But if you get really good at that, so the people at Shadow of War or uh, mm-hmm. Shadow of Mordor and stuff, they actually are like some martial artists, animators, and they <laughs> have worked with each other for years, and they actually put the suits on and capture that stuff. Like usually, we hire that person out, but because yeah. they're their animation insights, like they know what they they want to get out of the performance and then they go and act it out. I thought that was amazing. I saw that as a, as a GDC talk. But yeah, there's sometimes, you know, like if I try to just pretend I'm driving and then like record that and then animate over it, it would look awful. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, okay, all I always say all animation is tedious. You just have to find the tedious task that you like like or love. So what's what tediousness in combat design do you love that others might not like? So, okay, yeah, I got to put this to combat design. When I actually took some animation courses at mm-hmm. RIT as well. And mm-hmm. one of the things, uh, it, it's not animating, I guess. It's uh, just texture unwrapping. I felt that yeah. really calming to, like, unwrap. Yeah. And, like, sit there. I like, like yeah. movie unwrapping. Like, everybody hates it. But I'm like, this is cool. Yep. Yeah, I, I loved it. That was, that was my favorite part. Um, okay, what's the tedious thing in combat design that that I enjoy doing. Uh, I don't know, I used to like, I like to play through the encounters and find the exact timing that made the monster pop out of the ground like in an interesting Pixar way. Like, you know how the Pixar blink? Mm -hmm. Like, so I would go through all my fights and make sure that every time somebody pops up, it was like one, two, you know, like it's just, instead of just at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and, And just, going through and remembering all that or coming up with like little scenarios that uh, that tell a story that, that no one's ever gonna really know. Like, okay, like 
the player is going to come in at this time and then over five seconds because these guys are off doing whatever. Like it's, a, it's very it's small, like tedious thing that nobody thinks about. But like, I spend the time to be like, no, all my fights are going to have this like yeah. start, meeting, and end, and they're always going to have the blink uh, that I call it when they come I feel in. Like people probably innately feel it even if they don't know the story behind it. Yep, they. I believe so. Like um, on God of War 2018, there's a little small spoiler. There's a fight in front of this stonemason face. And uh, there are some characters that come in, but it, it's set up in a way to surprise you. Mm -hmm. um, so you feel like the fight is one thing and then it escalates like a wrestling match, like it escalates, <laughs> doubles down and then, then it gets easier again and you feel good about it. So it's yeah. a story that I thought of for the whole level, not even just that fight, for the mm -hmm. whole level, you don't see characters that are like that until that point. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what really like puts you into like, the lull of like, okay, this fight is gonna be like this because you're seeing different characters up until that point. So yeah, yeah. I take the time to do that stuff. Nice. Cool. Um, so what do you feel is, was the biggest breakthrough in your career or have you had multiple? Oh yeah, there's so, yeah, there's so many big breakthroughs, right? So Brian actually, Brian May, my mentor and friend, he exposed me to um, the people at Dinosaur they were going to be making this this game that was a 3D action brawl or something I'm equipped to do. Mm -hmm. And that was a breakthrough by getting that first opportunity uh, and using their, uh, the guy, who Jesse Sosa, who was like uh, creating the characters, he had a talk or he had a process on polycount. And I used that in my capstone to be like, this is why you want to make modular characters. Mm -hmm. So I think getting that first opportunity and then making that fight, that combat game, uh, allowed me to start getting the other looks from Microsoft and, and landing that first opportunity at Microsoft. Now I feel like I'm a real game dev. I'm making real money. And um, I think the first big, huge breakthrough for me is when I got flown out here to interview for Sony. Uh, mm -hmm. I never thought I would work for Sony Santa Mai. I just thought I was going to work for a company like them and emulate mm -hmm. what they did. Uh, in the interview, I was telling them that like this is my Super Bowl moment. Like you know, just just getting here was like enough to make like just be considered. So then we got that, and uh, yeah, I was at the Game Awards when. All right, I was, first part, I was there when they announced God Award for the first 2018, and that was an amazing moment. And then I was at the Game Awards when uh, we won. And like I just start, I like jumped up. I was so happy because the whole whole project, I was like, this is the game. I've always wanted to work on and being on this team is just amazing. I'm, I'm working with the people I looked up to, these Titans, these mentors, these giants that I'm working with. I'm just happy to be here, but I really want to win game of the year. Like every, I was like, don't worry, that little change is going to make the game 0001 better. And we're always striving to make game of the year. And then we did it. And I was yeah. like, I, I had this lifelong dream of like getting game of the year. So I, I, I started crying instantly. Yeah. This, this kid who, like they, I couldn't read. Like you know, I couldn't yeah. for the longest time in middle school and things like that. I wasn't smart. I'm not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I could do these things. Mm -hmm. And I found this thing that I love to do that they wouldn't even have to pay me to do. And uh, I, I, all the oh man, there's so many. So I get a little choked up thinking about it. Like mm -hmm. getting into college is one thing. Like. Uh, there's times where people oh, I wouldn't even go to college because like, how am I going to get support? Maybe I won't be able to do it. Right. There's a couple of times where I was taking courses in school and I wasn't doing as I wasn't living up to my potential. Mm -hmm. And they're like, maybe you can't do it. Not understanding that I'm, I'm battling a couple of things and like, maybe you can't do it. But that professor who was telling me that, I don't think he was actually being, at the time I thought he was being malicious, but mm -hmm. I think he was actually trying to challenge me to, push harder and, and like f him i'm gonna do it yeah and so uh i just can't believe that you know and i think back to it like i can't believe i'm, I'm working at my dream job and yeah. uh, like i said in the beginning i like to give back i want to show other people that you can do it too don't listen to people who say you can't do something yeah um so has has your like skin color or, or any other is like obviously like the dyslexia has kind of mm -hmm. hit you in your animation career, but has any other like thing impacted you or has it been okay? I think I th it's hard to say, right? Like, um, was I scrutinized over a little bit more 
because of my last name, oh, how a GBA is hard to read, like, you uh, know, on a resume, maybe they didn't want to bring me in for something, mm-hmm. or maybe I didn't look as capable. Um, a lot of people, but it's hard to say because, like, uh, video games are very selective of who they let in. Yeah, maybe that maybe they didn't see something in me because I looked a certain way or they didn't think I could do it. Um, but there was a lot of people that gave me a couple of chances mm-hmm. and that worked out. So I feel like racism in North America was like, or, or up in New York is like uh, very subtle. When mm-hmm. I was in Texas, um, you know, there's some spots that you shouldn't be at, you know, <laughs> but I, I feel like in my career, it's, it's always been more subtle until I got uh, Sony is very uh, Sony Santa Monica specifically is very um, diverse mm-hmm. and it's a matriarchy. We've always had oh, women in leadership. Mm-hmm. And, um, for the most part, I've never I've never felt that at my current job. But there was some times in some other roles where you're trying to make a dark skin character and they're like, don't say dark skin. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, and I was like, no, this is important. Like this. We need this character. It's going to yeah. not just help sell. It's going to help uh people see themselves in the game yeah so we're still fighting for that for my other friends who are in other roles right now other companies yeah like speaking of your last name i feel like um like i don't know where this came from but ever since college it's been like very important for me to pronounce people's names correctly (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're good like when i was a part of the like north star academy yeah. I was a peer assistant for North Star Academy, you know, like Mr. Brown could not read people's names. And I was like, I'll do it for you so that <laughs> can be pronounced correctly. Right. And I'm like, I've always been able to like say your name and spell it. Like, I just be like, I be like thinking, I'm like, ah, because it's not spelled how it sounds. But I'm like, yeah. okay, I got yeah, it. Right. You know what? Be honest. When I'm around other Nigerians, I'm from a smaller tribe. Anyway, most people know Igbos or, or Yoruba people. Mm-hmm. I'm from Urobo, which is mm-hmm. a, with a U. And my father, he speaks Igbo as well. But even there, they're just like, how do you spell it? They're like, I don't know. Like, what tribe are you? I've never heard of that tribe. You know, like, I've never heard of you. So they're, they're good on you for being able to spell it because even my people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is how you spell it. This is how you say it. And it's eleven characters. Yeah, I used to run track in high school, and right after they're like, "How do you spell your last name?" I'm just like, oh, "I just ran." <laughs> but oh, why? Oh, you know, it's it hard. You should have just had like a little piece of paper clipped to your thing, like here. <laughs> I wish. I wish. My coach eventually came over uh, years later and started telling them how to spell it. But <laughs> yeah, so like. I just, I just find that so important because like, like people's names are so important and in America, like they make it seem like you don't not supposed to care about everybody's name, so. Yeah, it's interesting. My father wanted to give me a more uh, Nigerian first name as well, but I feel like people struggle with Stephen with a PH uh, right <laughs> now. So thank, thank you Steph Curry as well, making it a little harder. A lot of times they'd be like, you know, Stefan. Yeah. Or, or step step hand, you know, like <laughs> the way you're supposed to. It's the way you're supposed to spell it. There's a secret war between us PHs and Vs, you know. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. You a V? Uh, I don't mess with Vs. <laughs> so, like, okay, like RIT is where, like, is where I'm from in Michigan. Mm-hmm. It's like black, white, Arabic, Mexican. That's it. <laughs> like, <laughs> no country. Like everybody. <laughs> Like, don't nobody get no flag. But when I went to RIT, everybody got a flag. Everybody from some country. I'm like, okay, this is new. I'm just regular black. Great, great. (laughs) Like, I learned more about, like, African people and, like, Caribbean people. So, like, with you wanting to get into art and being Nigerian, was that, like, was that accepted or was that like an uphill battle? <laughs> yeah, so so I'm half, so like in a way I'm kind of mixed. Like I'm, both my parents are black, but my father is straight from Nigeria and he has a whole interesting story of how he came over here. I think it has something to do with the Biafran War and him being a uh, ship uh, stowaway on a ship. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the hard work kind of comes from. It's just in my blood because he mm-hmm. just worked hard uh, just to get here, right? But I didn't actually gl- grow up with him. Uh, I actually grew up with my mother who was very happy that, oh, I don't know, being a young black boy, like you, 
your mom wants to make sure you're safe mm -hmm. and games became an escape mm -hmm. right so she noticed that i was safe if i played or and i did other things i was still outside i played sports and did things like that but uh she fostered the the, the artist in me that that's a place that i could be more safe in because there's times where like yeah i could go places to play volleyball or basketball but i might get hurt those places uh might lead to me to unsavory circumstances yeah so even she didn't want to drive to texas by myself so she, yeah. she hopped in the car but yeah nice uh, she she helped she she always allowed me to do and what i what i want to do my mom is an amazing person and she um she basically let me let me go for it every time. And Miss Woodward too, she helped in a lot of ways as well. It's like my second mom who, mm -hmm. who said like, we're gonna figure out how to get you in the games, you know? Yeah. And I, took the pro I took one programming course in high school and th thought I could be ready and one typing <laughs> course to help me get ready for RIT because they knew yeah. I'd be up here about it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. So um, other than, okay, so like you did Mechanite Chronicles, Product Spark, that yeah, my dad. Real quick, my dad was not with it at one point. If I told oh, okay. him, like, you're not a lawyer, doctor, or engineer, like, yeah, that's what like, that's kinda... a typical like Nigerian experience. But some people are like, oh no, my parents were like supportive. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> like, yeah. So for the most part, I was trying to tell him I was an engineer, and even before I got Microsoft or or something, people were just like, you make games, or you're like a jester, like, what do you know? And I was like, I work for Microsoft. Oh, he works. Ah, he works for Microsoft. Yes. Good. That's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, you were saying about like Mech Knight Chronicles, the different games that I worked yeah. on. Yeah, Project Spark, Pratt Princess Chronicles, and God of War. Is that all the games you've worked on? or? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, there's some student projects in there as well. You know, Card Kingdom was, was big. Mm -hmm. um, the the game we, we talked about the for autism, there was also a couple of games in school that I worked with um, different businesses to, to help make. Yeah. Um, but the big ones, yeah, are that. Meg Knight Chronicles was my first indie project with Jesse Sosa and friends over at Dinosaur Games. Um, it's a, uh, I say 3D action brawler, but it, it, think of like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles the, the, or X-Men, like the arcade kind of brawler like yeah. that. And then Project Spark was Microsoft's game about making games. And it was a, this beautiful little toy that uh, people made all types of different art with, but it was very difficult just like making a game is very difficult to get into to understand how things work, to pull these levelers, to make the, the art that you're trying to express yourself with. Uh, so it it didn't take off in the way that they were hoping for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I ended up going to a smaller studio, Fat Princess Adventure, which is a game that's sort of like uh, Diablo or um, it's like a, a isometric like pulled back game and they, they had a lot of like fun things in there the game is already called fat princess right like, <laughs> what does that even mean but yeah. the characters would eat a lot of cake and things like that so i made up uh, different um combatants and worked on some of the hero abilities in that space before i landed the microsoft uh the sony job here um making encounters for for god of war and now i'm making uh maybe i can't talk about it i don't know Sony's kind of weird but i make combatants and stuff now so <laughs> Yeah, I always have a section where I kind of name all your projects, so I had forgot to say that earlier. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Let's see. So um, as someone getting more years of experience in the animation industry, have you decided, like, what your purpose is in regards to, like, blackness and black professionals in animation? Absolutely. I want to tell, um, before, I wanted to win Game of the Year, right? Like, that was, like, a personal goal. Mm -hmm. um, but something that was also driving me is like, I wanna be a pivotal part of a million people's stories. Mm -hmm. Like uh, there's games that like touch me in a way that I'm just like, I, I always remember this moment where I beat this thing or the story that was told in it, or uh, I was overcoming some hardship in my life that I felt the character was reflecting. So mm -hmm. now I think my job is to start building those characters that look like us and tell black stories and black experiences mm -hmm. or fusing that into any product that I or work on. I was just like, oh, okay, you know, this character is going to have a more African background or this character is going to know what it feels like to be an outsider. Because I feel like that's something that we can all identify with in certain ways. You know, um, I'm somebody who's black and African, who's got this dyslexic quirk, you mm -hmm. know, I'm tall and athletic, but I'm also nerdy. Like, so mm -hmm. There's so many things where, you know, sometimes black and Africans don't mix. Mm -hmm. And 
if I'm around African, you're like, oh, you're kind of African by blood, but not by like culture. You didn't really live with your father. You don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you you can play basketball, but you don't love watching basketball or, or breaking down Kobe's moves because you're too busy enjoying anime and things like right. that. When anime wasn't cool, it's cool now. And it's yeah. basketball and anime. Like I was totally even into that back then. But um, yeah, how do I how do I get that into games? How do I make this game that's going to help you learn how to read a little bit better or cope with loneliness that comes with being an artist? Mm -hmm. Nice. Um... What do you hope for the future of an, uh, of video games as far as like innovation, storylines, characters? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I want to see more characters that uh, have a diverse black experience, you know, like thinking about the code switching or, or our, our Black Panther, our uh, Spider-Verse. Mm -hmm. Like you can show that like, oh, I'm in a bilingual household, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have to change the way I talk when I'm out with my uncle versus the way that I'm uh, in the street. And having that just like to be the Atlanta or insecure and just like that, that's not the focus. That's just like something that happens in their in their day to day life. And we're not focused in on this very yeah. small thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't wait to, to play characters that are going to tell people those stories and, and allow little black and brown boys to be like, yeah, that could be me. Or yeah. black and brown girls would be like, yeah, I love this. Like this character's not just a princess, he's a warrior, like Okoye, like, you know, like I could be like her. Yeah. So. Um, what do you black um, like artists and uh, like animation professionals do in this current landscape that you're doing, hope to do or wish to do with all like this technology and open mm -hmm and all this free stuff man yeah what are we what am i currently doing i mean i'm always thinking about collaborating with some friends and always trying to get some more people in the space i think what's already happening right now is there's more studios that are focused on telling these black stories and experiences mm -hmm. um, i'm learning from those people um i'm trying to take in as much of that media as i can yeah. like reading um tuskegee Hair airmen the um oh. This comic book about it's just like just buying yeah, into yeah. any of that yeah to see air hairs like like that yeah like, yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Visual. yeah because uh my great uncle is actually like a to see airman second class so nice. he uh and just seeing uh, there's it's fictional but like just being able to connect on that um one of the other books i really enjoyed was war girls which mm -hmm. uh talks about like black futurism like what would nigeria look like in the future like it, not the matrix per se but like if we had afros but there's like bees inside and the bees are like little cameras and and things that move. it's just like it was it's so trippy to think about our blackness in uh a cyberpunk world that's just like yeah we're still talking about jollof rice and, and this and that but we also have mechani mechanized arms yeah that, how that all just blends together it's, it was a beautiful mm. story or hearing uh about uh blood and bone and mm -hmm. talking about the Orishas. Uh, mm -hmm. My name, the, the first part, OYA, is Oya, oh, yeah, is and that's an Orishan god. Mm -hmm. So, speaking about our pantheon, you know, like in God of War, there's all types of different pantheons that he destroys, right? Vikings and. Mm -hmm. But what if we started, not in God of War, but what if Black people were making a game like God of War, talked about the different Orishas or yeah. Aztec gods, gods that are kind of forgotten, or other West, West Indian mm -hmm. or West. African and West Indian uh, people like Anansi. Like, what if that was a hero? That would be so dope. Yeah. Um, so if someone was producing a documentary about you, what things would you want them to highlight about your life outside of your work in video games? Uh, highlight outside outside my work. J yeah, just the, the struggle and the people. I always feel like my life is kind of like this, this weird movie. Of like, he did what? You went where? You know, like even now, like you got this amazing uh, YouTube channel and whatnot, like, and we know each other. First. Like just when you when you saw that I was in Louisiana, uh, uh -huh. um, but anyway, like uh, I just <laughs> highlight. <laughs> I don't want to get it stuck, but I was there for like a bachelor party and like that. But we're the beautiful thing about that. Yeah, this would be in the documentary. The beautiful thing about that is like we were a bunch of guys who went to RIT and we're. Where one of our friends is getting married, and we didn't do any of the, like the traditional bachelor 
guy thing. Like we were, we were so nerd hardcore that like we wanted to play some games at home and like make sure that we eat. We went to an escape room and we crushed it because we understand how like the room was put together. And like we never thought about anything, anything typical uh, of that. So I, I would love for those moments to be highlighted and. Yeah you know the i want to also highlight the people that helped pave the way for me like my mom mrs woodward the amazing yeah. people at columbia the amazing people at rit that helped you know everybody who helped uh in their small way and just how they saw something in me before i even saw it like so. yeah and and also like coming up with a couple programs and, and things that i i did yeah just just goodness just being nice good to people for no good reason so like, I just want to mention the story behind the like seeing you. So okay, like, I I was the president, like local New Orleans chapter for the, the Urban Young Professionals, right? And I'm like, I don't know if I was the, I, I'm guessing I was the president at this time, or I was the social cultural chair. But I was like, trying to find social things for us to do. So I'm like on this website like trying to see how expensive escape rooms are because like New Orleans people, you know, we got like modest solder, salary. So I'm like not trying to break people's pockets, but we're trying to like get together. So I'm like on the site, on the like, on the homepage and like all the like photos are flipping through of like groups of people who have go gone to this escape room. And I'm like, that's Steve. Like how, what, he in New Orleans? And like, he just hit me up. Like what? <laughs> So people forget where I'm at all the time. So I, I, I'll be losing track of people too. Yeah, like, I, I, was, I didn't really take offense to it. I did call you out. I'm like, because uh, you're like my buddy, but like. Right. <laughs> but yeah, it, I mean, that's that's not just one of the moments. I, you know, there's so many other moments where like I run into people and they're just like, what are you doing? I, I met Fred, I was in uh, Chicago watching World Cup FIFA or something. And I ran into big brother Cold Fusion, and he like tapped on somebody. He's like, "Yo, is that guy? Is that guy a Sigma?" And I'm like, "What, a, dude? What are you doing in Chicago? Why are we at the same bar?" He's like, "I don't even live here. I'm just here visiting a friend." I'm like, "I live here visiting a friend <laughs> too." So like, just moments like that, just run into people. And then before I end our interview, I do want to mention that like at some point you were like a model, or are you still modeling? Oh yeah, yeah, I still model from time to time. But, like, yeah. What? What purpose does that serve? Like, was that to like normalize anything, or like, what? Why do you model? <laughs> why do I model? Yeah, so that's a good story. I mean, don't look at have a part two. Kind of like, and just talk. <laughs> no, um, why do I model? Is actually because I was trying to be in more cultural things at RIT, and I did some of the fashion, uh, fashion shows, just walking and learning how to walk and things like that. Um, eventually me and some of the bros, we went to Atlanta Greek picnic and one of the guys there was like, I'm putting together this calendar to help people, uh, who are affected by autism. So he's like, I want you to be in the calendar. And I was like, I already had a body for it. So I was like, sure. I didn't believe him at first. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But like, no, you really flew me to New York. And we, I was really in this calendar mm -hmm. to me. It started with, with giving back to, uh, you know, being back for culture for service, pretty much like mm -hmm. we were doing it for autism. But after that, I was like, maybe I can really be a model. I went to Buffalo Fashion Week, did some stuff in New York Fashion Week, and been in on some book covers and things like that. But uh, it's not it's not too fun for me. Like, it's, it's just something I could do, like, uh, just with my athletics and other things. Um, so I, I keep up with it. And I guess now, like, some places want me to be, um, uh, what do they call it, affiliate, affiliate marketing or influencer kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, not a whole bunch of purpose there. I got asked to be on The Bachelor when I moved out here uh, <laughs> twice, actually. The first to be like a contestant and then for it finally came out. But I was like, oh, yeah, they like asked me to do that a couple mm -hmm. of times. And I was like, no, nah, I just got this job. I got my dream job. I can't take a month. I can't just, I can't do that. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So I, but so growing up in an all white area, I never felt attractive even to this day. I don't feel like I exemplify um, what women are into sometimes. And people have always said this to me, but I, I still suffer with this imposter syndrome for my looks and for what I do at work. So I, I never felt, I never feel like a model, you know, people, people say, say these things. And uh, yeah. but I'm just yeah. a regular guy. I'm just your regular everyday around the way neighborhood friendly Sigma, you know, that's it. <laughs>
Definitely. So how can people see your work and follow you on social media? Yeah, so you can follow me on social media at Tribal Knight. Uh, and that is night like the guys who do chivalry and ride horses. Uh, that's also a fun story because I was in a, uh, I was going to walk in um, a mass camp, like carnival uh, mm -hmm. in Toronto. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, you can also find my work uh, by playing God of War 2018 on your PlayStation 4 or 5. And you can see my stuff on LinkedIn. There'll be more websites soon, coming soon. So that'll be good. Cool. So thank you, Steve-O, for coming on my platform. I really appreciate it. No problem, Debbie. This is awesome. We got to do more of this. And thanks, everybody. You know, I wave like this because of RIT and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> don't know how to spell it. Not not really, but I'm just going to say it, you know. <laughs> so to everyone out there, I want you to like so I know it's real. Comment and tell, you, tell me how you feel. Subscribe to Citadel and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace. All right. Peace. Later.